Romeo and Juliet fall in love, it's a forbidden romance, and their families are surprisingly understanding, and they get married and live happily ever after. Joel takes Ellie across the country, finds meaning in life through their bond, heals from the loss of his daughter, and the Fireflies are able to do a non-invasive surgery on Ellie to make a vaccine from her immune system, and humanity is saved and Ellie and Joel retire to Wyoming. Jinx kidnaps Silco and Vi, they have a tea party, and hash out the trauma all three of them have experienced throughout the years. The season ends with a big group hug, and they all become a happy family together and now peaceful Piltover and Zahn. Okay, you see what I'm getting at here? We want a certain kind of sad ending from these stories. Bill and Frank dying at the end of their episode made the story more beautiful than if it ended with them not having health problems and just being cute old happy gay men together. For some reason, this idea of dying in each other's arms in this tragic but inevitable romantic act made people feel like, oh my god, yes, that is how this should and what a beautiful story. So, why do we find tragedy beautiful sometimes? It's not all tragedy, it's definitely not all sadness. And yes, I am using the word beauty specifically and intentionally here. There's good storytelling, that's not what I'm talking about. There is overlap for sure, but beauty is a more specific subcategory. Iron Man 1 is a great movie, it's fun, it's exciting, it has great personality. I would not call it beautiful. Hunger Games is not beautiful, but this moment I would say is beautiful. Jurassic Park, great movie, not a beautiful movie, although again, this moment is definitely beautiful. Up, everyone is always talking about how beautiful the intro sequence is. No one is saying, oh, the middle third of Up, so beautiful. And like I said, it's also not sadness per se. A lot of sad scenes, a lot of sad stories are just sad. No beauty anywhere in sight. But sometimes, under specific circumstances, certain types of tragedy are like the most beautiful thing ever in storytelling, and I want to know why. Now, of course this topic is a nightmare to talk about, because beauty as a term is such a mess. We are so sloppy with this word. When I say, oh, that painting, that is a beautiful painting. I could be talking about the texture, the colors, the composition, the realism of it, or the feeling expressed by the subjects in the painting, or the feelings I'm feeling looking at the painting. And then when I say beauty in reference to a person, I mean a totally different set of disconnected meanings. If I'm talking about my favorite K-pop idol, it means I'm attracted to this person. But let's say I'm talking about like a picture of a grandma with her grandchildren, and I say, oh my god, so beautiful. I'm saying this old woman looks so happy and fulfilled. The word there means a certain warm and fuzzy mood is being conveyed through this image. But then if it's like Ron Swanson and I'm saying my god what a beautiful man, I mean this guy is really 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 cool or maybe I aspire to emulate this guy's image. And then switching gears entirely again if it's a song, oh now beautiful means the music evokes calm peaceful emotions or it evokes really strong emotions that are not calm at all. Both of those we call beauty and music even though they're seemingly contradictory. And lo and behold I start I started writing this video with one idea of beauty in my brain. I had the single answer to the question that made sense to me, but then I thought maybe I should ask around. So I posed the question to my new fancy Patreon Discord server, because I got one of those now, and we had this insanely long discussion about it. Everyone had different ideas. I was keeping a list of like 10 or 15 distinct ideas of beauty and storytelling, all completely different from mine, and we were sorting through them all and trying to figure out which ones we liked best, which ones resonated with particular beautiful scenes and stories and characters, and then just to throw a wrench in my own brain process, I asked a mathematician friend of mine, what does it mean when an idea in math is beautiful? And her answer was totally different. And then I asked a neuroscientist friend of mine, and his answer was also different. And then another mathematician friend and his physics friend, and their answers were also different. And at this point, here I am staring at like 20 different definitions of beauty, and it's hard not to ask the question, maybe this topic is too subjective? Maybe there's no productive video to be made here? Maybe I shouldn't even try? Nah, of course we're gonna try. So immediate pattern, the Jurassic Park scene. It's it's not just the music, it's not just the visuals. You could have all that, but if these characters had seen dinosaurs before the scene, it would not carry the same weight at all. The beauty here is, oh my god, I'm seeing a dinosaur. It's, oh my god, I never thought this was possible. To borrow a term, it's a perspective expanding moment, which is similar to what two of my patrons mentioned in our discussion. The general principle Aiden is describing here, what a sleepy ginger elaborated on. You watch your mom bake cookies 999 times, and then one day you really see her make those cookies, and it's beautiful beautiful and novel and familiar all at once. Beauty involves a shift in perspective. It can be in something small, it can be in something big. I mentioned borrowing a term earlier. What I was referring to was how my friend Tamar described beauty in math. Listen to her answer here. I think that for an idea to be beautiful in math, it has to be simple and surprising, sort of like some sort of creative route to an idea or a surprising conclusion that comes about from something that's simple to follow in some way. I don't think that's the whole picture, but I think the reason those things are necessary is it's something that's 
sort of like perspective expanding. That wasn't her whole answer. I'll leave a pin comment with what she said. But this idea of a perspective shift, specifically in a way like she says, where we get this expansiveness, what once was just a little bit is suddenly so much, that seems very important to defining beauty. And it also fits the Hunger Games scene. We witness the death of this little girl who we've seen this entire society treat as worthless. These kids' lives mean nothing. We kill them for entertainment, especially poor kids like Rue. And then we get this moment. No, it does mean something to all these people. They're all feeling our outrage. They're rioting. They're fighting back. This unimportant death suddenly becomes as important as we feel it should be. It's absolutely this powerful moment of expansion. So perspective shift, perspective expansion, maybe that's it. Maybe that's beauty. No, because I pulled a fast one just now. Because the Hunger Games sequence was already beautiful before this part of the scene. The sad part where we were in shock and crying and singing and putting flowers, that was the real beautiful part. The expansion was just the cherry on top. So then let's change gears. Here's another set of definitions. Tell me which idea resonates for you more with this Hunger Games scene. This was Ben's idea. When I think of a beautiful story, I think of stories like Your Lie in April or Everything Everywhere All at Once or Steven Universe or The Last of Us, and I think there's a sincere tenderness at the heart of these stories, with characters trying to navigate a strife-ridden world to find that tenderness. Watching characters go through so much tribulation for something so quiet and small is, to me, beautiful. Tenderness in a strife-ridden world, that is such a great description of this scene. Or look at this set of ideas. These are all different ideas, but I want to highlight a commonality here. What about beauty defined as sincerity, stories without cynicism, real genuine feelings that don't feel artificially made through drama? Absolutely, this is something else that's going on here. This scene feels so genuine. It feels so sincere. And we can contrast with this other scene in The Hunger Games, which also feels very sincere. I volunteer! I volunteer! I volunteer as tribute. You need to get out of here. No. Go find mom. No. Grim, go find mom. I know. No. So sorry. But it definitely falls into that made through drama category Rain is mentioning. Rue's death just feels like what a person would do for a dying child in this situation. It feels really organic. It feels really genuine. And to bring it back to Arcane. I thought maybe you could love me like you used to. Even though I'm different. Again, this line of dialogue is so sincere, so genuine. Don't cry. You're perfect. Again, super sincere, super genuine. And also for both of these scenes, tenderness in a strife-driven world, that fits perfectly as well. So both of these seem like good definitions. But is there a commonality with the dino scene? Because that one feels different. We can talk about the reactions, which are very sincere, but that just doesn't feel like the whole story. It doesn't feel like the sum total of what's going on here. The majesty, the wonder, the perspective expansion, all that feels too important to ignore. Well, it doesn't feel quite related to these two definitions. But let's take a closer look at Ben's definition for just a second here. It's not just tenderness, it's tenderness in a strife-ridden world. Why that second part? It definitely feels right, it feels accurate, but why? You're perfect. This moment, the context is definitely part of the beauty. In fact, fast forward a little bit, you see it even more. The moment I find most beautiful by far is her final moment of decision, where we get the self-empowerment and the tender memories right up against the absolute devastation. We got the beauty of the moon, and we got the rocket. We get both. Last of Us, not everyone finds this ending beautiful, but for those who do, it's absolutely because of the context. There's extreme violence here, and doom. Humanity is being doomed into oblivion, but also tenderness, and sadness sacrifice, and love, etc. So, another idea that kept coming up in our discussion was complexity of emotion, and another idea was paradoxical emotions. And once we were there, well, let me get my first theory. And I'm going to borrow from a timely piece of writing that's making its rounds lately. Brandon Sanderson recently wrote this wonderful essay about himself. Basically, he wrote the article that that dumb wired guy should have written, and at the end he had this line. I still don't feel strong emotions outside of stories, but I did tell an interviewer lately that I sometimes cry when writing scenes in my books. They just aren't the scenes that I thought he'd expect. I don't necessarily cry when characters die, or when they marry, or even when they find victory. I cry when it works. When it all comes together, and in a beautiful, shimmering burst of humanity, Humanity, I feel what it is to be that character. I think there's a type of emotion and a magnitude of emotion that puts us in touch with our humanity, in touch with life. When we encounter emotions that feel samey, that we're used to, that are unnuanced, that relate to familiar experiences, we've been desensitized to those. But very unusual emotions, very rare emotions, very big emotions, those make us feel life again. We go from feeling disconnected to feeling extremely connected, often to ourselves, but it can also be connected to a fiction 
fictional character through identification. It can be connected to the people experiencing the story with us, or even connected to the artist, their passion, their depth of emotion. Their life sometimes shines through the art. And whatever the object of the connectedness, there are a few common methods of producing this effect. Wonder is a perfect type of emotion for this. You don't usually feel a little itty bit of wonder. Wonder is almost always this overwhelming experience. It's powerful. And it's rare. It's not an everyday emotion for most people. So wonder easily produces beautiful scenes, majesty, awe, very similar idea. Serenity, if it's a real complete sublime level of it, also exactly what we're looking for. Rare in our own lives and big. Another great method is mixing emotions that are not often mixed. The mix will usually give you an emotional product that's nuanced enough that it's rare and unusual. Happy and sad, tragedy and empowerment, cruelty and love. These mixtures, these paradoxes, pretty consistently produce unusual, powerful emotions for us. And a common variant on this is finding a more familiar emotion in a surprising place. When we get a scene that's really silly and also really intimate, or a scene that feels really silly and really profound, or like we saw in Ben's definition, tenderness in a strife-ridden world, that is like the quintessential form of this method. Now, natural question. Tenderness in a strife-ridden world? What about strife in a tenderness-ridden world? Shouldn't that also fit the last method we talked about? So connectedness per se was just step one of this definition of beauty. Step two is a vital condition. It's not just connectedness itself, it's focusing on the connectedness. And that is not easy at all. We all know the idiom, stop and smell the roses. Classic idiom associated with beauty, with connectedness in life. And we all know from experience just how hard it is for us to actually do that. Just about anything can stop us or distract us from stopping to smell the roses it is an extremely fragile state of mind that this beauty is capable of existing in. So the way this fragile focus translates into storytelling is that we get our rare powerful emotion, but of a type and in a circumstance where we are lacking for nothing emotionally, and thus distracted by nothing emotionally. Story-wise, that means if we need something specific to happen, and that's being withheld from us, that will undermine this condition. It will distract us, it will prevent us from focusing, prevent us from stopping to smell the roses, it will prevent the scene from feeling beautiful. Also, certain entire emotions emotions just don't jive with beauty for this reason. Fear often isn't beautiful because we want to get out of there. Certain types of anger, same thing, anger often demands action, and then similarly envy and desire. If anything, beautiful scenes are usually moments of fulfilling desire, i.e. it's that moment of release, of satisfaction when we're now suddenly newly lacking for nothing. Now our desire is fulfilled and we can just bask in the kiss or whatever. And then probably the most common method of producing a moment when we're lacking for nothing is that we've reached the end. Romeo and Juliet, there's nothing left to be done here. If there was some obvious plot thing we wanted to happen, if we were waiting for that to happen, it would totally undermine the beauty of the scene. And the other endings we talked about as well, we see this nothing left to be done state. So endings in general, great for just basking in big emotion, but really it doesn't even need to be the end. It can just be an end. The up intro is presented as a complete story, which is intentional. It's a trick. We think this old man is at the end of his life. Really, he's at the beginning of a new adventure. And to take this ending idea even further, really any moment in a story where we feel a big emotional journey complete itself, as long as it leaves us in a place where there's just nothing to do, nothing we want to do, nothing practically to do right now, that also fits this criterion no matter where it is within the story. Rue's death, there's nothing to do here. We just want to grieve, we want to be in that emotion. The dino scene, we just want to stand there and gawk. Similarly, the perspective shifts we mentioned earlier, this applies to that as well. It's not just any change, it's a change that feels complete. And then once it is complete, we're given a moment to just bask in this new perspective. It's not we're going to stand here and watch mom bake cookies, but there's something else on our mind. No, we're given a moment to completely be absorbed in that situation. And another excellent example, famously beautiful moment, is the train scene in Spirited Away. Probably worth its own video, but we get this unique emotion, and then we just sit, and there's nothing to do. The train ride necessarily takes time, and meanwhile we're encouraged to just be in the weird emotion of this moment. Okay, now let me tell you something that may surprise you, having gotten this far in the video. All of this that I've said so far was only what I got from that discussion with my patrons or what I built on top of that discussion. But that's to say the original idea of beauty I was going into that discussion with was completely different from everything I've said up until now in this video. There are parallels, but I was coming at it from a much different angle. So here's my idea of beauty. And then we'll talk about maybe trying to synthesize the two ideas. So let's go back to our Last of Us and Arcane happy place. Sad place, sad, happy place, beautiful, focused, place. The zombie apocalypse takes Joel's daughter from him, robs him of all meaning in life, renders him into this loner who has to literally shovel sh 
and burn child corpses to survive. That bleak lifestyle and mindset leads him to doing the ultimate task he does not want to do in escorting this dumb kid, which turns out to be this glimmer of hope to get back all of what humanity lost, develop a vaccine, end the apocalypse. And in that heroic journey to bring humanity back to life, Joel finds his own humanity again through this bond. And when it comes time to complete that journey, the journey itself ends up being what prevents him from completing the journey. His humanity is what turns him inhuman. The hope of humanity becomes what undoes his hope. Attachment to what was prevents the world from returning to what was. Or alternatively, attachment to the future prevents the world from moving into the future. And in this moment, once you see the ending, everything just falls into place. All the side characters arcs suddenly become a single arc. Life is not worth living without the ones you love, and that inevitably leads to either accepting death or compromising your morality to survive. And in this moment you also see the zombies thing I talked about in this video. This world is full of zombies, either actual zombies or humans living like zombies, embodying zombie tropes, adopting this life of violence for empty survival, even eating people. Or to go even further with a trope, I didn't mention this in that video, but what do the Fireflies need from Ellie for the survival of humanity? They want to cannibalize her brain. Everything goes back to the zombie tropes. Even Joel escaping that paradigm by choosing meaning in life over emptiness, it's still living by necessity, it's becoming a monster for empty survival, it's still the life of a zombie. Every thread in the story ties into this single, elegant, multifaceted idea. Every little path in the story was leading us to this one destination. The characters, the plot, the themes, the setting, everything, the whole story becomes this single, super cohesive unit. It. Arcane is the same thing. There's lots of ways to define what the big single multifaceted idea is. I'll let you watch the 10 hours of arcane content on my channel to explore that further if you wish, but broadly we see progress and peace be the cause of their opposites, the cause of destruction and war. We see love become chaos and chaos become love, and we get all these plots converging on each other, all these character arcs overlapping, the themes uniting, and it's this scene that's granting meaning to every detail. It's this scene that's rendering the entire story into a single, elegant, super cohesive whole. I have these two friends, a math PhD and a physics guy who are writing a book on physics, and one of the quotations they pointed me to was from a physicist named Steven Weinberg. Listen to this. The beauty that we find in physical theory like general relativity or the standard model is very like the beauty conferred on some works of art by the sense of inevitability that they give us. The sense that one would not want to change a note or a brushstroke or a line. This is exactly it. Same thing in stories. The story used to exist as all these different parts and characters doing different things, and we got this theme over here and that theme over there, and we got random motifs, and then it all condenses suddenly into this one simple perfect thing that it was inevitably always going to be. And we look at that at the end, and we would not change a single note, a single brushstroke, a single line. And to differentiate this from the previous idea, this is beauty in the thing. The previous idea had beauty producing a beautiful experience in me. Here it's an aesthetic appreciation of the story. The story itself is a beautiful work of art because of its elegance, its internal simplicity, its internal unity. Beautiful even if there's no one to observe it, beautiful like nature, like an idea in physics, like an idea in math. To me, this is the most meaningful form of beauty in storytelling. It's witnessing perfection. And that can come from everything working out perfectly, or from everything falling apart perfectly. In terms of the internal simplicity, triumph, tragedy, it doesn't matter. Okay, so we have two ideas of beauty. The first is an experience of focusing on sublime human connectedness brought about by rare and powerful emotions. The second is the aesthetic quality or impact of absolute simplification of star elements and details into a single, inevitable, perfect, super cohesive whole. To unify these two ideas, or at least synthesize them in some way, let me revisit something in my mathematician friend's answer. Tamar seemed to be describing a similar pure aesthetic idea as what I'm saying in definition two, except she didn't just say simplicity. What did she say? It has has to be simple and surprising. What's that about? So I think idea two can be understood as its own separate thing and as a specific instance of idea one. We don't just want to see simplicity, we want a journey from chaos to simplicity. How often do we feel perfect simplicity in our chaotic lives? It's an incredibly rare emotion. And it's an incredibly powerful emotion too, I mean you can see it on the guy's face in the meme. So we need the simplicity and the surprise. Surprise meaning we're going from one extreme to the other here. One moment we're lost in absolute chaos, the next moment perfect, elegant order. And concentrating that journey into a single moment 
makes us feel the journey between extremes more potently, as always, as I've often talked about. Now, this synthesizing of the two ideas of beauty isn't unifying them. These ideas are still separate, I think. This is just showing how they perfectly complement each other. When we have idea two, we always also have idea one. So, let's go back to our original question. Why do we find tragedy beautiful sometimes? So, to start off, if beauty is about feeling connected, tragedy just does that easily in a super straightforward way. Our heart goes out to characters experiencing tragedy. We feel their depth of emotion, we feel their sincerity, and we feel the artist's sincerity too. These moments of vulnerability and darkness are so intimate for us that when we see someone expressing those feelings that made us feel so alone in our own lives, when we see another soul out there in the wilderness also going through misery, whether real or fictional, that connects us to them. So at its most basic, tragedy is just a really inviting foundation for exactly this kind of connectedness we're looking for. But it's also so much more than that. Tragic as a feeling is many steps beyond just sadness, and it's a particular kind of sadness too. Sadness, like default sadness, is what we feel when things don't work out, when we can't overcome the obstacle, when life is beating us down. Tragedy is when everything in our lives conspires to work against us all at once. It's not just that we can't overcome the obstacle, the obstacle overcomes us and defeats us entirely. Life doesn't just beat us down, it destroys us, it dances on our graves, and there's no hope of ever coming back. So what I'm getting at is that there's a natural completion to tragedy. Tragedy is an ending, there's nowhere to go, nothing to focus on except the feeling, and it's a powerful feeling. Except, still, not all tragedy is beautiful. And I think A, it's because tragedy can still feel a little too unnuanced to feel rare or unusual, and also tragedy is often just too painful for us to focus on the emotional experience itself. If the story is just beating you over the head with your feelings ceaselessly, you're actually going to want to disconnect. We're going to get the opposite effect that we're looking for. So no, for beautiful tragedy, we need something to change the pain into something you want to bask in. And that's why we need the emotional mix, the positive and the negative. Tragedy and romantic love, tragedy and parental love, tragedy and empowerment. And it's interesting, besides Romeo and Juliet, I wouldn't even say tragedy is the focus of these other two scenes once they become beautiful. The Last of Us is a tragedy, but with a focus on violence and parental love. Or doom, maybe. Dooming humanity and feeling human. Arcane is a tragedy with a focus on destructive chaos and empowerment. Moving a step deeper, tragedy, like we said, isn't just a thing not working out, it's everything not working out. Everything in the universe is conspiring against us to bring about our end, or an end. And this works so well with what we said in idea two, we want a journey from chaos to order, and tragedy is very ordered. And then what that leads to is this comprehensive implosion of all these story elements at once, but implosion in a way that's very directed, everything becomes unified, the elements all parallel each other in their ideas and their meaning, and it gives us this sense of unification. And by the way, it's an even greater or broader sense of unification because we have the positive and negative mix. Because we're bringing the good and the bad together, we're unifying those two. The positive is causing the negative, and the negative is causing the positive. It all makes sense, there's nothing left to explain, nothing left to account for, nothing left to do. It's yin and yang. The entire story is now one simple, inevitable, super cohesive entity. And it's tragedy that provides parts that are designed to fit together so well into that super cohesive entity. Because tragedy is already so ordered and so cohesive. And this last element I'm describing is something which is not present in scenes that are just sad, or stories that are just sad, or even stories about tragedy. It really is only a specific kind of tragedy. It's specifically that good, bad, ugly, beautiful unification form of tragedy. So, it's not just that we like feeling sad. Or maybe we do, maybe there's a different idea there. But my conclusion is that beauty is not intrinsically linked to tragedy. Tragedy just happens to be a really great tool for laying out the circumstances beauty likes. And by the way, just to frame this whole topic, beauty is this really important aspect of storytelling. I feel like I never hear people singling out as its own topic to discuss. For me, one of the main reasons I wanted to investigate this topic in the first place is that when I think about what makes good storytelling, I've often found everything revolving around these three super categories. Powerful, beautiful, and interesting. Powerful, very straightforward what that means. Interesting, still pretty straightforward. Beauty, I really felt could accurately be called its own category, but I had almost no idea what it meant. I knew it when I felt it, but I was so in the dark when it came to defining it or even describing it. So this inquiry has been a long time coming, and obviously, like I said, this topic is kind of insane to try to investigate because of how slippery and undefinable beauty tends to be, especially given how we use the term. I barely talked about the pretty soft, peaceful emotions type of beautiful storytelling, which is a whole nother category, and I didn't talk at all about what I guess I'll call materially beautiful storytelling. But overall, I would say I am absolutely not satisfied with my own analysis here. There's definitely places where I conflated good storytelling and beauty, even though that was explicitly a line I said I didn't want to blur. I feel like I totally blurred it in places I probably did, but that said, I did make progress in my understanding. I made a lot of progress. And just as an example of progress, the ending of Arcane Episode 3 was absolutely tragic,
magic in its feeling and its aesthetics, meaning the surprise simplicity factor, but I still felt like something was preventing me from finding it beautiful as a tragedy. But after this analysis, I'm realizing it's because we were left emotionally lacking for something. We lacked quite a lot by the end of the scene. Things we desperately wanted to happen, feelings left unresolved, situations we wanted to change, that prevented the focus factor which is necessary for beauty, and meant that we couldn't deem this story tragically beautiful until we got some sort of completion like we did in episode 9. So anyway, beauty and storytelling, I absolutely love this aspect of storytelling and I want to see more of it. So on that note, if you also find topics like this interesting and important, consider joining the Shni Patreon Discord server. Maybe I should come up with a name for it. <laughs> anyway, consider joining the Patreon and joining the server, which is where all this exciting discussion went down. Discussions like this is what the server is all about. We just had another gigantic discussion about what is likability and what makes characters instantly likable for us. Shoutouts to Aiden and Sleepy Ginger for spearheading that one. And the server has also just been a great place for writers to connect, meet each other, become buddies, get good feedback on projects, help each other brainstorm, start writing groups, and just generally be writing dorks and nerd out about fiction stuff we're all passionate about. I've been having a blast there, so if that's something that sounds fun and valuable for you, we would love to have you. If not, no worries. But big thanks to everyone on there who helped me talk this idea out and see all these sides to it I was totally missing. Like I said, it would have just been a basic form of idea too, if not for all the discussion we had. So thanks to Ben, Rain, Lyrian, a Sleepy Ginger, Tachanka, Aiden, Niv, Joanne, Zilch, Bags, Cheshire, and all the others who participated. Outside the Discord, also thanks to Tamar, Levy, Sammy, the E and Z duo, and Teacher 4. Shout out to the new high tier patrons, Lorenzo Art, Persephone Red, Niv, and Madeline Clemens, and thanks to everyone watching. Have a beautiful day.